Hey, how's everybody doing? My name is Mark, also known as DJNSM. Go to DJNSM.com to find out more or hit me up on Twitter uh, using the handle DJNSM. Today I'm taking a few minutes and I'm going to rapidly show you how to make a platter or clip pack. And this is really, really important stuff. This is under teached and I want to make sure that I get this stuff out there because it's it's one of the most important things that you need to know as a uh, Ableton or live producer and most particularly as a performer. And this is going to be focused for performance, but it does cross over very well to activities in the production room. So I'm going to be warping an Ill Gates tune today. I went over to illgates.com and grabbed the Tiny Tempo Remix, which just happened to be the top one out there. Grabbed it, warped it really quickly, and we're going to start from a warp track. You can see that I have a bunch of warp markers in here already. I always recommend people to know all their macros and uh, how to use the follow command and things like that. So we are warped and ready to go. I've also taken notes while I warped it on how I want to break this into a clip pack. So the most important uh, thing I need to tell you right now is use a vanilla uh, a vanilla environment for all of this work. The most, uh, most importantly, you keep effects off of tracks. You'll see there's no effects on my tracks. I don't even need the MIDI. And I save this as just a temporary file. And, and when we're done with this, we'll put this in another place and save it better than it is now. But it's just good to have this as a reference place. The reason this stuff is so important is because this is how we use templates. Whether or not you're familiar with templates, it doesn't matter. You're going to, they're, they're going to catch up to you. You will need them. And per production templates are one thing, but performance templates is what I'm talking about. And this is how the big guns use it. And you know who I'm talking about. And yes, this is how they do it. This allows us to drag our material in and operate as if we were DJing records. Instead, we have prepared material. It's fantastic. You're going to love it. You can also use multiple templates, meaning I have a live PA template, a glitch template, a house template, etc. So I can use these same clip packs that I generate because they're decoupled in different environments, in different templates. So it's just wonderful. We will be using Live 8 today, and I highly 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 recommend that you you use live 8 for all of your warping for quite some time live 9 is definitely slower and i don't know if ever when it's going to be stable at this point but uh, you know we're keeping our fingers crossed so live 8 is a really great place to be because it'll always it'll always drag into live 9 but if you warp in 9 it's not going to go backwards if you're in a pinch so we're going to start with a warp file as I said, I've already identified how I want to cut this up, and we're going to include parts like the head, the tail loop, drops, chorus, verse, and all sorts of other curios. So you can use a warping template, doesn't really matter, just make sure there's no effects on the tracks where you're working, okay? So start off with the creation of a master warped track. I only have one instance here, so I'm just going to do Command-D or Control-D and duplicate this. So this top one up here is not going to be touched. This is the original warping that we worked with. And then this one is where I'm going to continuously warp. Once you've identified how you want to how you want to cut this up in a clip pack, which is best done during your warping, just taking notes. I have a big piece of paper in front of me here with all my notes on how I want to cut this up. And uh, it's a secret language that only I understand, but it's highly effective. So I have about 10 parts that I want to use. You can always make it smaller. So clip pack big and then reduce later. It's easier to cut stuff out than to add it. Trust me, and uh, I think that many of you will agree who've, who've ever had that. The first thing I'm going to do, although this seems a little backwards, is I'm going to create the tail loop on this sucker. Okay, The tail loop has been identified to start on measure 97 and loop for six measures. And because I have done all of that math, I can say loop starting at 97 for six measures. Boom, we have a tail loop. So zooming out, you can see right here is our loop. And we're just going to play that. while that plays in the background. The idea behind a tail loop is this should seamlessly repeat. And here we go, here's a, here's a repeat. And this allows us to mix out. So I can go to the bathroom and if it gets the end of the track, it's gonna loop. Now granted, that's repetitive, but it's a lot better than silence. So this allows us to have this, in this case, six measures keep looping over and over again. I can cut the EQs and start mixing the next track in so I can DJ as it would be. So. There you go, there is the tail loop. The reason why we do that first, and I always, I, I almost always, like 99.9% .9 of the time have a tail loop because I like that safety net. And I like being able to mix out like that. The reason why we do it first is because now as I duplicate this clip, I will carry that tail loop with me. So no matter what I do, I will always have a tail loop. So if I start on the 37th measure or the 69th measure, it will play until it gets to the 97th and then I'll loop for those six measures over and over and over again. So you always have that safety net. 
So we're going to duplicate that. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to take this first track and I'm going to actually make my head loop. And my head loop is identified as starting on measure one and looping for eight measures. So. Uh, it's okay. I'm good. Let's go. Let's go. So I'm going to take the volume down a little bit here and talk over this. This is the exact same as a tail loop. This allows me to cue this track and let it be rolling in the background, fade it in, do some EQ manipulation, and then be able to crossfade into this. And it should just seamlessly roll over and over and over and over and over and over again. So that one is all done. Now, I have a special naming convention that I use that helps me identify these tracks. This is really critical, and I'll be releasing more information on this. But basically, the first thing that I do is I put in the measure number and that is so important. It allows me to know where I am in a track and where it's going to launch. This launches on the first measure and it happens to loop for eight measures. And that's, you know, that's really, really important. I just write head loop in there. So now, now we have the head loop. The next one we're going to put in here is, is the head drop. So we'll duplicate that down and the head drop just starts on nine. That's all it does. Starts on nine. So I can go right here and say starts on nine and play it. Yeah, we bring the stars out. We bring the yeah, we bring the stars out. We bring so I can the, cue yeah, this here. We bring the stars out. I'm just hitting it over and over yeah, again. We bring really, really handy. So that one's done. And per naming convention, this is starts on measure nine and this is a head drop. Okay. Next. You see I'm always duplicating one ahead. It's a habit. It's a really good habit to get into. The next one is starts on 17 and this is the main drop. So basically we go in here. I've already named it. Oops, you know, I really like to keep the um, the file names in there. So 17 main drop. That way I know what I'm playing. If you if you kill that that ill gates remix label in there, then you may kind of forget where you are. And it happens to the best of us. So this one starts on measure 17. And boom, you can see that that one is now starting at 17. So that's a main drop. I love it. All right, going down, moving down one. Next one is main drop number two, starting on 23. So this one starts on 23, and this is main drop two. Okay. And then we go down here and we say 23. Boom, another one is done. The next one I have identified is a two measure to a drop. So it's like a pre-drop almost. So it starts on 27 and then it goes for two measures into a drop. See how that nomenclature works? So it just kind of gives me clues on what's happening. So that starts on 27. Let's take a listen now. Second measure. And the drop. Love it. But I may not want that to have that quiet two measure sort of build up ish sort of thing. So I'm also going to go in here and I'm going to say, we're just going to do the same damn thing. And we're going to start that at 29. And this is just a drop. Okay. You can go in here and, and heat map these things or do cool stuff later. So, oops, I forgot to put the 29 in there. So there's your 29. Next up is going down on my paper, paper, paper. Uh, measure 45 is a good drop. So, oops, let's do that correctly. So I'm using Command R, left arrow, 45, and writing this drop. And this one starts on 45. Boom. So let's just make sure it does it. No, they say all that and they say all Perfect. Duplicate down, select the next clip. I have a, on starting on measure 47, there's a two measure loop I want to use. So this one is, starts on 47 and loops for two measures. That's my secret language I'm letting you into, okay? So in this case, we want to say loop starts at 47 and loops for two measures. And this is just something that I thought would be really fun to mix with. Here we go. See, that's a beautiful little two measure loop. Heat mapping is when you go like this and you say, all right, this is dangerous. I use pink because this is a great thing to punch into. Moving on, the next one I have identified is a breakdown looping for two measures on me measure 70. So we are going to duplicate that. And this one starts on 70 and is a loop for two measures and is a breakdown. Okay. 
and uh, we're going to do the same thing here. This one starts on 70 and goes for two measures. Let's hear it. Take a listen. I actually screwed that up a little bit, I think. Yep, there we go. Always watch your loop braces and starts. There's some wonky behavior there, and, and there's ways around it. I just tend to operate fast and fix the errors and catch them on the fly, so definitely pay attention. This one is also sort of a punch, so we're going to make that one pink as well. Duplicating down, the next one after 70 is measure 73, which is another drop, okay? Oops, let's keep that text in there, 73 drop. And this one just starts on 73. Simple enough, let's just make sure it does that. Love it, perfect, awesome, moving on. Next up, we have identified the tail loop, which we've already done, so we'll just delete this and close out our process. So this starts on 97, and this loops for six measures, and this is a tail loop, okay? So, and we're done. This right here, this is the clip pack that you can see me highlighting. And let me, uh, let me show you how to finish this and then go into some of the meta to close this out because there's some things I'm doing here that are really fine, but they come from years and thousands and thousands of years of experience and working with people all over the country and, and the world. So let's, let's get this saved, okay? Now there's some settings inside Ableton that will allow you to save this stuff as a clip pack. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to my desktop on my Mac here and I'm going to create a folder and I'm going to call it this is where I put things. Okay, so I have this folder called this is where I put things. I'm going to get into that folder. Let's just show you a quickie hack. The if you're doing this with multiple tracks, like like this, uh, it's the top left. However, we're going to do this with just one, so it's basically this track. Rename this track. The way I do this, this is another naming convention that is really important and a super duper awesome hack. Okay, this will automatically name the folders correctly for you. And one additional little hint in here is to put the BPM. I use three-digit BPM. I've identified this as 99 BPM. Whether or not it's 99 BPM, I am not sure, but I'm going to roll with 99. And you name this top column, and then I can just say, hmm, I'm just going to take that total name. I'm going to pin that to the 99. So this top column up here is now named 099-Illgates, etc., etc. That name, this name right here, is the name of your project in your ALS file that you're going to create using a reverse drag and drop methodology. So here we go with the reverse drag and drop. The way you do that is you shift select, multi select, however you want to do it. Right now I'm holding down my shift key and hitting the mouse button and you'll see that a bunch of those guys just turned uh, yellow. It's subtle but you can see it. Another way to do it is shift and I'm just using the down arrow and you can see me selecting all of them. With all of those selected what you're going to do is you're going to grab them and just like you can move them around and, and do this sort of fancy business, you can reverse drag and drop them into this folder. This is where I put things. So I'm going to release now. Watch. Boom. It created a folder and an ALS file. When I hit enter, I have an opportunity to rename the ALS file. But when I hit enter, and I'm just going to keep that name because I pre-named using the column hack, it's going to pull those folder, those files in, okay, or file in this case. Here we go. There we go. See all of them copied. There is a setting that will not let that happen. I use this particular methodology for a very important reason. This means that I can grab this folder here and give this to you and you can work with my track. The samples are all in a samples imported and here's the mp3. <clears throat> Use a WAV file. This is just an mp3 for demos. So that's it. We're done. I'm going to show you how this stuff works. Now that we have that going on, watch this. Zoink. That's how it works. So if this was a template and I had a bunch of tracks and each one had fancy business going on, I would come in here and I would say, ah, this is the next song I want to play. And I would stack it into the appropriate column. And then I would navigate down and start playing that super duper awesome, killer, awesome, wonderful, pimpin' beauty. I don't know, need more adjectives, but that's what I chose. So let's go back and let's dissect some of the meta that's going on here, okay? One thing that's really important is the placement of the measure number. So I stacked this track twice, once you know, on top and then another one down below here. And because I 
put that measure in here. I know that this starts on measure 1, 9, 17, 23, etc., etc. If I if I didn't do this, I wouldn't know where the next song starts. I know it starts right here because it goes back down to 1. Really, really awesome. So always put that measure in there. Another thing that's really cool about that measure is uh, I'm going to take the volume down here. Is when you're playing, I'm going to start this on 17. So you can use the focus hack, which is this field right here, okay, and I'm like, okay, the next clip is 23, all right, so I'm about, I just hit 23, so I can say, all right, when we hit 27, that's 26, there's 27, here it is again. So what this allows you to do is using the focus hack, which is this field right here, I'll key command it for you really, really quick. i just put a backslash on it. When this is playing, watch this. I'm going to select another track, right? By hitting the backslash button, boom, right to the wave. Awesome, awesome stuff. So this, this means that I can watch the waveform and I can zoom into this thing while it's playing and say, ah, this is playing at 45, then 46, then 47. I have a cue point at 47 that loops for two measures, so I can tag that and let that go. So that allows you to go into cue points and loops that you've prepared ahead of time. The fact that I'm heat mapping this stuff, like, you know, this would be a little bit cooler, so I use blue, because it's just a beat. This drop, eh, it's not that hot, so I'll give it a yellow. This is heat mapping. All right, that's a lot hotter. You can hear more noise in there. I'll have to give you a little more volume in this. See, that one also is about as, as hot. So I use those. That one is maybe a little cooler. This one is maybe a little hotter. So by heat mapping this, I can tell if things are mellow or not. So these are punches here, which means there's something weird going on, or I could stop everything and come in and go. Which is great. So that P, that pink, that punch is all mnemon mnemonically cued with me. Here's another drop. That sounds a little bit heavier. Let's just pretend like that's a really hot one. Boom, even darker. And then the tail loop. Tail loop's a little cooler. We'll put it back down here. So if you do this and you heat map them, what ends up happening is we can do, we can re create this and put that back into here and this is the heat mapped one okay now when you drag this in you'll keep all your colors in there super duper handy so now I can look at this and say ah I know what's hot and what's not and and you've got it that's the basics I'm just gonna dissect this a little bit more you're free to go about your business and start working with this stuff again reverse drag and drop is the shiznit you will see this pattern repeated all over the place. And this is something that I've always teach students in every Ableton class I've ever taught in every academy or anywhere I do workshops in the US, okay? Very, very important. I do have a request for comments and RFC on the naming conventions, and I might release a version of that with this so you can kind of see how I think. We're trying to standardize terminology so that we can exchange these files a little bit better between grid performers. So that's really, really, really good. And uh, again, the, oops know about this boom and boom that is your wave focus if a track is playing and you have something mapped to that it will pull the wave in front of you okay super awesome it also has similar uh, functionality uh, for MIDI tracks I believe but we're not doing MIDI so we won't talk about that column name hack again up on the top love it use it it's awesome so you now know how to make clip packs this is exactly the process that you're going to need to do in order for you to use templates. So enjoy yourself. Have a wonderful day. And uh, this is the inaugural video from our new place out in Brooklyn. So my name is Mark, also known as DJNSM, and you have yourself a fine day. Bye now.